Many of you have known individuals that have been blind. And the senses of a blind individual um, sometimes are overwhelming in some other areas. And uh, many of you have heard my story about working uh, for a blind pastor. And one of the most amazing moments that I had working for him was a day that he was in his office. And uh, I heard a noise in his office. And uh, he, he being blind, I kind of watched out for him in certain areas to make sure he was okay. And I heard this noise in his office and I just opened his door. And this blind man that could not read was on his knees before God, praying. Tears coming down his eyes and down his face. And he was praying over individuals and he was calling people by name. And he was going over issues. A man that did not recognize a single individual by facial recognition. But felt their pain in their heart. And he was on his knees in his office just praying. As a young man, as a young pastor, that kind of taught me a lesson. Taught me a lesson that pain is real. And everyone has a story. Last night on my Facebook wall, I asked you to respond to the time that Jesus touched your eyes. A time that he touched your life. A time where maybe there was things going on and you had no idea what to do, but Jesus came into your life and he touched your life. As Oprah Winfrey would say, the awe, awe moment. The moment where you knew what God is trying to teach you and it would not be the same again. We all have those moments. The Bible says that what we need to do is we need to have a heart after God and we have to understand what God wants for our life. So today we're talking about being touched by Jesus in your life. I believe outside of our salvation in Jesus Christ that he gave to us through the blood that he shed on the cross. Being touched by Jesus is the most important thing outside of salvation that you can experience. Amen. Change. Getting off of what we know and doing what God wants us to do. I'm going to give you some scriptures today about Jesus healing two physically blind men. But there's not too many people in here that are blind. So I could talk about the physical healing. But I believe there's so much more than a physical healing. I believe what this church needs and what you need and what I need would be a spiritual touch from God. I believe we need Jesus to touch our eyes and to open up our heart to see what God actually wants for us to do that's what we need. That's what we desire. Oh, these men begging, these men at the gate of Jericho, they cried out, oh, son of David, I need you. And Jesus, seeing these blind men, heard they called him the son of David, which knew it was a messianic term that Jesus, the Messiah, was going to come out of the lineage of David. So they understood that Jesus was not just a good man. Jesus was not somebody that just walked by. He wasn't just a good teacher. This was the son of God, the only one that could meet their need. The only one that they could cry out and cry out. And God had compassion for them. Do you need Jesus to have compassion for you? In your marriage, in your home, in your kids, at your job. Do you need Jesus to hear you cry out and say, Lord, I need you. And Jesus said something very neat to them. He said this and he's saying it to you. What? do you want me to do? Jesus looked at him and he was on his way to Jerusalem. He was hours away from his death. And he heard these men cry out, Lord, I need you, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus 
was moved with compassion. And he asked them a very simple question. What do you want me to do? And they said, we want to see. We need our eyes opened. And he touched them. His eyes were opened. And then they followed him. See, the stories that I got from you, I have about 15 of them. Some of them are heart-wrenching. Everybody has a story. Everybody has that awe, awe moment where they needed Christ and they were depressed, they were out, and they were, they were fearful. And God gave to them insight. God touched their eyes. God touched their heart. There's a song, Open My Heart, O Lord. Touch me. Let me see you through the emotion of my heart. And I believe so often, church, that we want to see Jesus with our head. We want to see him with our eyes. We want to understand what he's doing within our life. We want to understand everything that he wants us to do. And that is great. But what Jesus wants us to do is open the eyes of our hearts spiritually. Touch us in a way that only he can touch us. Touch us in a way that he can see us and we can see him as he truly is. I want to read this text, and it's a, it's a wonderful text. The, the setup of the text is Jesus is leaving Jerus Jericho, and he's going to Jerusalem. You know what he goes to Jerusalem to do? To die. He's in the last hours of his life. His heavy heart. But even in the heaviness of his heart of knowing what he is meant to do, he hears the cries of people. He hears their heart. He doesn't just walk by them and say, I got important business to do. I got something I have to do. He cries out to people that are struggling, people that are hurting. This is days before he dies. Verse 29 of Matthew chapter 20, it says this. Now as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting on the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Then the multitudes warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out even the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. So Jesus stood still. They stopped Jesus in his tracks. Not because they were hurting, but because I believe Jesus heard his position. Son of David, this man knew that Jesus was the very Son of God. They knew their hope was not in a doctor. What they needed, they needed the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus, to heal their eyes. They heard it. And Jesus stood in his step and called them and said, What do you want me to do? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. Ooh. Our eyes may be opened. Not that I could just receive sight. That our eyes may be opened. And I believe that's exactly the same thing. That if we want to be on fire for God. If we want to change our life. Our eyes must not just receive sight. But to be opened on what God truly wants us to do. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight. And what did they do? They followed. They didn't just say, thank you Lord, I'm going to do my thing. Once our eyes are opened, we should follow. We should do certain things because God truly wants 
us to do. The worst thing that we could ever do is have sight, but not to have understanding. To be able to see physically, but not to see spiritually. We all go to church and we know what the Bible says, but we don't do what he asked us to do. Our American proverb says it this way. There is none so blind as he who does not see. As he who does not see. We say that we're a follower of Christ, but yet we don't see what Christ is doing within our life. These stories that came back are heart-wrenching. Heart-wrenching. But each and every one of them ended saying, when Jesus opened my eyes, I understood what to do. I understood that I'm safe. Or I understood that God wants to have fellowship with me. Or I understood that God wants me to serve him in certain areas. Because we all have a story. We all have a V8 moment, if you would, where we hit our heads and say, that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what God wants me to do. Sight, but cannot see. Living a physical life with sight is fine. But as we were talking in our offices today, is, and we asked a simple question, we all have different, would you want to lose your hearing or would you want to lose your sight? Would you want to lose your physical health or your mental health? It's all a trade-off. But I believe one thing that we cannot lose is our spiritual insight. When we have our spiritual insight, it changes everything about us. The English novelist Samuel Butler said this, A blind man knows he cannot see and is glad to be led, though it may be by a dog. But he is that blind man in his understanding, which is the worst kind of blindness of all. Believes he is at his best because he can see and he scorns even somebody that tries to guide him. In other words, let me give you a, a practical step right here. You're in church today. You're in church because you want to have a fellowship with God. You're listening to a preacher that you've heard his stories and you know his life. But what you're asking God to do is to give you something that will change your direction of life. Your V8 moment, your aha moment. You may know it. But God wants you to understand it. God wants you to not only have sight to see, but a heart that understands. Jesus touched their eyes, and their eyes were open. So my question, what is it in your life that you can see physically, but you struggle spiritually? What are you struggling with? What are you fighting with? When you open up your eyes and all you see is yourself, all you see is your surroundings, but you don't see what God wants to do within your life, you are physically, you have physical sight, but you are spiritually blind. And I believe so many times Christians are spiritually blind and they go through life in chaos and fear and anxiety. But there's a time in our life, just like these men that were blind at the gate of Jericho, Lord, I need you. Lord, I know that you're my Messiah. Lord, I know what you've done for me, but I need you. I need my eyes opened. So I want you to think as we go through this outline, what is it in your life that you're blinded by? What is it that the sin that you're in is keeping you from doing what God wants you to do? What is it about the pride that you're holding on to that God says, I want you to cry out to me. And when you cry out to me, I will have compassion. I'll have empathy for you. And I'll walk beside you. And I will give you insight. To see physically, but not to understand spiritually, is ignorant. To be able to see things, 
but not understand what God wants us to do is we play the game instead of what God truly wants us to do. So I want to give you, last week I had 10 points. <laughs> so, oh, this week I only have three, so it shouldn't be near as long. When Jesus touches your eyes, he gives you eyes of faith. You see Jesus as he really is. See, when Jesus touches your eyes and your eyes are open, before sometimes we think that Jesus is Santa Claus. Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. But when he opens up our eyes and see who Jesus really is, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus was moved with compassion. In other words, he knows what you struggle with. And he's not mad at you in your struggles. He's moved with compassion and he wants to open your eyes, give you insight, to give you understanding of what you can do through your struggles. See, when I said everybody has a story, but not everybody's story can be used because our story to be used has to be open to God's handling of it. And so often we have our story, but <laughs> I may be embarrassed of my storm. They may think bad of me. They may not respect me. They may not like me. If they knew what I had done, they wouldn't follow me. They wouldn't listen to me. Can I tell you about a story about a man in the Bible that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament? He hated Christians. He put Christians to death. He was, he was against God at every turn. But there was a time that Jesus touched his eyes. There was a time that Jesus came beside him, changed him, and he radically changed everything about Saul, changed his name to Paul, opened up his eyes, and he became one of the greatest leaders of the church because Jesus touched his eyes. He could have said, <laughs> not me, Lord, Remember Stephen? I'm the one that helped stone him. Remember the believers in Antioch? I'm the one that tried to crucify them. Believe everything? I can't be a follower of Christ. But when Jesus opened his eyes, he said, I can't do anything but follow Christ because of what he has done for me. So often our eyes are blinded to what God wants us to do, but when he touches our eyes, we have eyes of faith. Son of David, son of David. In other words, we understand that these men knew who Jesus was. When they said that Jesus is walking by them, there was only one hope. And we only have one hope. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes after the Father but by me. This world, they do not believe that, do they? They don't believe Jesus is the way to heaven. Jesus may be a way, but as long as I'm good, or as long as I do what I should do, I'm safe. But we as believers in Jesus Christ, our eyes are open to the truth and know that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Open the eyes of my heart is not being upset at somebody that does not believe the way that you believe. I understand that my job is to have faith in Christ, to live the way that God wants me to live, not to debate somebody about their faith, but to live my life pleasing to God in front of them so they may say, how in the world do you do that? And you say, it's not because of my power, because I have a story, as do you. You have a story in your life that you could say, I am done with God. I'm done with the church. You could come up with that. You could say something that somebody hurt you so bad that you don't want to follow after what God wants you to do. But when God has opened your eyes of your heart and understand who God is, you see him through the eyes of faith and say, you know what? I'm not fighting about them. I'm fighting against Satan. Satan. I'm fighting against his realm of evilness. Here's what John said. 
And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. See, Jesus, he doesn't want us just to follow him blindly. He wants us to follow him with our eyes wide open. The blind men heard that Jesus was coming. And they could not stop screaming out, have mercy. What does that mean? That means these blind men were sitting at the gate of Jericho, relegated to begging. Cry out for mercy, saying, I cannot do this without you, Lord. Son of David, I need you. Stopped Jesus in his tracks. What you're going through. The story that you have. Lord, I'm tired of this. Lord, I don't understand what I'm going through. I don't know why I'm going through it. Have mercy on me, Lord. Change me. We will stop Jesus in his tracks. It'll turn him to you. And when we are honest with God, and he will say something like this spiritually, what do you need from me? We could say, well, I need a million dollars. We could say, I need my kids to do this. But what Jesus really wants to hear when he opens our eyes is a heart felt need. Lord, I need you to change me. I need you to open my eyes so I see what you can do through me. It's not about my comfort. It's not about anything else. But Lord, I need you more than anything else. Spiritual blindness to the truth, what God truly wants for us to do. The Bible says in First Corinthians, in Second Corinthians chapter 4, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, which is who? Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan blinds the eyes of those that do not believe. What's that mean? That means he doesn't want unbelievers to know Christ. But what he cannot change is when the believers of Jesus Christ said, open my eyes, let me live my life pleasing to you, Satan cannot stop you. You're the greatest force upon the planet because you're child of God and unbelievers are with you. And when we open our eyes to God and we do what God wants to do, Satan cannot stop us. But this if we are blinded to the very things that Satan wants us to do, and we don't ask God to open up our eyes, we are walking step and step with this world, and we are supposed to be aliens of this world. We're supposed to be a light in a dark world. We're not supposed to blend in and be liked. We're supposed to stand up and be accountable to the ambassador that we represent, and that is Jesus Christ. John Newton expressed it in these famous words, in amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch, worthless sinner like me. And once I was lost, but now I am found. I was what? Blind, but now I see. I was spiritually blind. I believed the world's philosophy, understood what they wanted me to do. But now that God has touched my eyes and opened my heart, I see Jesus as who he is in the eyes of faith. And when I see him as he truly is, it changes me who I, what I need to do. So the second thing, when Jesus touches your eyes, he gives you eyes of purpose. You follow Jesus on a new path. The Bible says these two men followed Jesus. They asked Jesus to do something miraculous. And Jesus did the miraculous. 
he healed their biggest need was their blindness. But he didn't just heal their physical sight. He opened their eyes. He opened their eyes to a point that they understood, I have one job to do. I was a beggar. I was blind. I encountered Jesus. Jesus changed my life. I'm no longer just going to be a beggar. I'm no longer living my life for myself. If it wasn't for what Jesus Christ has done for me, I am worthless. But when Jesus opened his eyes, they followed him. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it talks about two ways. A broad way and a narrow way. And so often we think about these as two different highways. But I want you to think about this as one highway. One highway, like in Houston, Texas, where there's six lanes, and you're driving, anybody try to drive on a six-lane highway? I mean, you're driving like scared to death, people driving 90 miles an hour, and you think, I'm from Wichita, Kansas. I mean, we're like three highway, but I remember the, I was from this little town, Wamego, and, and I went to Dallas for the first time, and I had to drive in Dallas for the first time. I mean, there was not a stoplight in Pottawatomie County when I grew up. And I went from there to Dallas, Texas, and they said, they said, we need to drive over here in the six-lane highway, cars going 100 miles an hour. And I was like 19 years old, scared to death. But that is exactly the way this world is. A major thoroughfare, a broad road that many people are on. But you and I are on a different road. We're on a road, not against them, but going a complete different direction of them. They are going down this thoroughfare 90 miles an hour, and we're going the wrong direction in their eyes. They're saying, you're a fool. Why are you going in this direction? They're going to the streets of hell, and we have the street to heaven, and we're going through them on the highway. And so often we are captivated of the fear of what they may say or what they may do or they may wreck us or cause chaos within our life. So what we do is cow down to them. Some of us even may say, I want to pull over of fear because of this street. And Jesus saying, no, they're the ones going the wrong direction. Don't stop. Don't quit. Stand and fight and communicate that we can do what God wants us to do. We have a purpose. And these stories that God allowed me to have through your words, it opened my eyes to some people with compassion, with understanding. And see, sometimes when we hear somebody's story, we don't see the facade. We see the real person. And when we see that real person, it changes the way that we perceive that person. Not out of pity and not out of arrogance, but out of understanding. And when we hear our story and we tell our story and God opens our eyes and says, I don't really care what somebody else thinks. This is what I went through. What happens is we call it divine moment. That God puts directly in front of you somebody that needs you. Somebody that can hit you upside the head and give you a V8 moment. Ah, that's what it's all about. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's what I struggle with. God did not create you to go to school, to have a good job, to make a lot of money, to retire. God created you to do something greater than that. That's our physical lives. This is what I desire. And that's what all of us have to do. But God wants us to do something that God has ordained you to do. He wants us to open up our eyes See Jesus for who he really is in the eyes of faith. And then have a purpose. 
And that purpose is to do something that God and only God can do. The awe, awe moment of our life is when we know what God wants us to do and we say, all right, all right. Have you ever tried to do something? <laughs> I'm terrible at math, okay? And uh, have you ever tried to take algebra when you're old? And it's like, ah, oh. And you hear all these formulas and all these numbers and you have no clue. And my boys were taking algebra and I tried to help them. And I'm, I graduated in 1981 from high school, okay? And I went to a Bible college. There wasn't too much math going on in Bible college. So I'm sitting there with this junior in high school taking, trying to help him with math. And I didn't get it. So I had to take him to a, to a, a, a tutor in math and and with somebody that knew what they were doing, they got the, uh, uh, oh, yeah, that's simple. But when I was trying to tutor them, that was confusing. But sometimes we as Christians go to the wrong tutor, and we get the wrong answers, and we don't understand what God wants for us because we go to the wrong source. And God wants us to go to the right source to understand exactly what he wants us to do so we can open up our eyes and say, that's what I'm called to do. That's what I need to do. We are not here to come to church and to listen to the soak and to sour because we're saved. We're here to change people's lives. And when they called out, Lord, what do you need? I need you to change me. And when he touched their eyes and their eyes are open, they followed after him. When was the time that your eyes were opened for the very first time? What am I asking? When did you graduate from Satan's family into God's family? When did the Holy Spirit of God convict you of your sin? When was it the time that the scales of sin were taken off of your eyes and the Holy Spirit of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, opened your eyes to see that Jesus was your only hope? I was 18 years of age. I can tell you exactly where I was and what I did and what Jesus did for me. I did not know I was going to be a preacher by any means. But that was the step of my journey to say, Lord, whatever you want, I want to do. I don't want to stay where I am. Just like these blind men. When Jesus healed them, they did not stay where they were. And in your faith, when you are saved, we need to stand up and do what God has called us to do. If I'd become a lawyer or a coach or a mechanic, I would still try to do the same thing. I would try to do everything within my power to honor God. When I talk to somebody, I want my life to be pleasing that they see Christ in me. Their eyes are blinded because they're blinded by Satan. But Satan cannot blind your testimony. He cannot take away your story. Your story is yours. As horrific as some of them are, as honorable as some of them are, our story is not ours. Our story has been given to us through the power of God to open up our eyes and to transport our heart, our life, into others that need Christ. It is our purpose, it's our job. Our churches today, they want to talk about Jesus. And we need to talk about Jesus. But this world is blinded about Jesus. You don't see, I wish they did, but this reality. You don't see the doors open and flocked in by a bunch of unsaved individuals. I just want to hear about Jesus today. Anybody? They don't come rushing in like that. People are not transformed in church. They're transformed in life. And how they are transformed are the people that their eyes have been opened to tell their story. Relate. Connect. Because this is the third thing. When Jesus touched your eyes... He gives you eyes of compassion. You see everyone as a potential prospect for Jesus to change. Everyone has potential. Just like you were a dirty, 
rotten, scoundrel, wretch, sinner. Preaching to you, Javier. That was you. That was for you. <laughs> but just like every one of us, we're a sinner. And our destination was where? Hell. And hell is real. But Jesus had compassion for us that he sent the Holy Spirit of God to convict us of our sins. And he wiped those scales from our eyes. And we know that Jesus died on the cross for us. Now I'm a child of God. Now I'm a believer. Now I know that Jesus loves me. Now I'm saved. Now what I cannot do is set and learn for myself. Now what I must do is I must go out with that same compassion that Jesus had for me and to be the church to have compassion for others. Because we all have a story. We all have failures and we all have weaknesses. I loved what the Bible says in Matthew 20. Jesus had compassion. Jesus didn't say, what have you done for me? How many times have you gone to church? What in the world have you ever done for the cause of Jesus Christ? Jesus didn't rebuke them. He rebuked the religious leaders that disobeyed God. He didn't rebuke those that needed God. Jesus walked up to them and said, what do you need me to do? And they said, I just need my eyes opened. Jesus changed their life. We, if we understand this as the church, Jesus does not walk physically in this world. Do you know who his feet, his hands, and his eyes are? Raise your hand. It's you. If you are a child of God, what we must do is we must have the vehicle, the power of the Holy Spirit within our lives to change people's lives, not because of what we do, but because who we have. Lord, I need you. I love what he said. His disciples really didn't understand everything until Jesus was ascended into heaven. Even right before his ascension, his disciples said, Lord, is it this time that you're going to come back and restore your kingdom in Israel? Jesus was crucified and he was about ready to ascend into heaven. And he said the Great Commission, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and to all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's not about your physical kingdom. You shall receive power. And the Bible says that Jesus said, one greater than me. You say, how can the Holy Spirit be greater than Jesus? Because in Jesus' physical form, Jesus was one person communicating one voice, communicating the very truth of God out of his voice. But let me tell you what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is God in you. When you gave your life to Jesus and accepted him as the Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit of God has come and take residence within your life. He convicts you. He comforts you. He gives you wisdom and understanding. And he said, I'm going to give you power. How do you know that? Because that same man, his name was Peter, cowering in front of a 14-year-old girl before Jesus was crucified, now stands up at the day of Pentecost and proclaims the message of Jesus Christ, and 3,000 people give their life to Christ. What is the difference? It's the same man, same personality, same fear. The difference is the power of the Holy Spirit came upon his life, and he stood up with power and boldness and said, I have been saved. My eyes have been opened. And I know what God wants for me to do. And that's not to cow down in fear. That's to stand up and proclaim. There's also a story found in Acts chapter 3. 
When Peter, James, and John was walking to the synagogue, and they did this every day, sometimes three times a day, and there's a beggar, a blind man, sitting at the gate of the temple. Peter, James, and John walked to that temple every day. They have probably seen this man thousands or hundreds of times. But this day is different. This day is different because now they have the power of the Holy Spirit upon their life. As they were walking to the temple, they saw this man begging for the very first time with compassion in their eyes because of the power of the Holy Spirit. They saw him with new eyes. And they walked over to him and they talked to him. And he said, silver and gold, I don't have. Giving you money is not going to fix your problem. Putting food in your stomach is not going to change your life. But he said, that that I do have, I want to give to you. I want to heal you spiritually. I want to give to you things. I want to give to you the most important thing, and that's Jesus. When we give people the hope of Jesus, it changes everything. The word there is attention. When they saw him, in other words, when they finally paid attention to their surroundings. See, when we are moved with compassion, we pay attention to those that are different than us. Oh, I understand. Uh, somebody's going to get mad at me here. I, if we watch Fox News, we understand Fox News, right? But if we listen to CNN, we may not understand all of CNN's positions, right? But if we are only listening to Fox News, we will never be able to minister to people on CNN. If we are only huddled in our Baptist huddle, we come to church and the only friends that we have believe like us, act like us, look like us, smell like us, I'm comfortable. But guess what? The church, you're already saved. You're already going to heaven. God did not call us into our holy huddle to be comfortable and safe, to be around people that we know and we like. God has called us to get away from what we are comfortable in and to get out to where we are not comfortable and have peace and pay attention to people that are hurting, that are struggling, and tell your story. Satan cannot stop your story. When you have a story and you are struggling, God does one thing for us. And he gives to us the ability to share our faith. Humanity will be divided into two groups. Those with and those without. Those that have Christ and those that do not know Christ, that will be divided. Now, I wish... <laughs> this would be simple for the church, but this wasn't Jesus' plan. This would have been my plan. If I was Jesus, somebody's, well, you're as close as I've ever seen to somebody like Jesus. <laughs> if, this was, if I was Jesus, when I got saved, I'd put a big old S on somebody's forehead. You're saved. You're saved. You're not saved. You'd have a big L on your forehead because you're lost. Wouldn't it be nice if we knew who was saved? And who was not? Wouldn't it be nice to see the big L on somebody's face? And I always question this. We walk into church, the majority of us have the big S on our forehead. We're saved, we're sanctified, we're righteous, we're going to heaven. But if somebody walked in the door and they had the L on their forehead, would we shun them or would we love them? We're not against them. Our job is to love them and have compassion for them. And we can take that L off their forehead. And you personally, because of your faith in Jesus, get to put that S on their forehead. Because you are a follower of Jesus. Have you touched somebody's life? Have you told your story? 
Has Jesus touched your life? See, because if we don't allow God to touch our lives, what we're going to do is we're going to be miserable. If Jesus stood before you right now and said, what do you want me to do for you? What would you say? Before you came in here, you'd probably say, I'll take a thousand dollars. I'll take a million dollars. I want a promotion. But when we are children of God and we have the S on our forehead, we can say the same thing. Lord, have mercy on me, the Son of God. And Jesus would walk up to you and say, what do you want me to do for you? And just like these blind men, I need you to open my eyes. And Jesus walks up to us and he says, I have mercy on you. And he touches their eyes and he opens their eyes. They're saved. They've been healed physically and now you've been healed spiritually. And the last phrase that they say in that scripture, and they followed him. He was about ready to die. We don't hear about these two men very often. But I believe these two men were in the upper room with part of the 120 because they followed Christ. It's not easy. The road is chaotic. There's bumps and there are bruises along the road. And sometimes along the road of Christianity, although we have an S on our forehead and we know that we're saved, life stinks sometimes. And we need Jesus sometimes. We need him to open up our eyes to see what we need to do and how we need to do it. And we need to have an awe, awe moment. So my challenge today is I hope this. I hope today could be an awe, awe moment for you. I hope it's a moment where sometimes you know what you should do, but you need to hear it from somebody. And the Holy Spirit of God pricks your heart and changes your destination. You say, Lord, I needed that. I needed that. Because my question for an invitation is very simple. When Jesus is walking to you right now, and he says this, what do you need for me to do? And they cried out even louder, oh, son of God, son of David, I need my eyes opened. When you're struggling, when you're hurting, when you don't know what to do, when you have a story in your soul that you're scared, Lord, I need you to open my eyes. I need you to give me the ability to share. Just because you have an S on your forehead, just because you are saved, doesn't mean you are done. It means the journey is right in front of you. Either we can be satisfied in our safety. We can grow our church with believers that believe like us, act like us, and talk like us. And we can fill up our doors with people that just like you. Or we can take our eyes outside of the church and look for the big L's. Not the losers but those that are lost. And we can hope, we can pray, we can change their eternal destination. That's what we need. That's what the church needs. And that's what you need. You know the greatest joy that many of you have ever had is not salvation because Jesus loves us. It's when somebody that needs Jesus that talks to you that are destitute that are on the devastating lifestyle and the end destination is hell but you tell your story and you tell your life and they say something in many different words but they say I need what you have well let me tell you what I have I'm a sinner I was lost, 
I did not know Christ. But one day, Jesus saved me. And he took my blind eyes and he opened them up. Now I know what Jesus Christ has done for me and I'm saved. And that's what Jesus wants to do for you. And if we could see it in a spiritual sense, in the different dimension, we would see the scales of this world fall off of the eyes of somebody you're telling your story to. And you could see the pricking of the Holy Spirit upon their life. They start investigating, they start seeking, and they use you to talk to them about what God wants to do for them. And one day, they bow their eyes and they talk to God and they say, Lord, forgive me. I am a sinner and I need you. Jesus used you to open somebody's eyes. Jesus cannot touch your eyes right now. He can touch our heart. But what Jesus wants to do with you is to touch other people's eyes. To let them see what Christ can do for them. My invitation. I believe in the last few weeks we've had some wonderful invitations. What is an invitation? It's not about how many people that can come down to this altar. It's when you talk to God in your heart. Oh Lord, have mercy upon me. Stops Jesus in his tracks. What do you want me to do for you? I just need you to open my eyes where I'm failing you Lord I need you to give me strength who I need to talk to I need you to give me power and boldness where I failed you Lord I need you to have mercy on me I love what he said and Jesus was moved with what compassion when you bow your head before him the sense of the Holy Spirit puts his arms around you and you feel the presence of God because the Holy Spirit of God is greater than Jesus and he wants to work within your heart within your life and he wants to come up and he wants to heal you but Jesus asked a question these men responded Jesus asked, what do you want me to do? And these guys did not say, I don't need you to do anything for me. I've got everything under control. I am happy sitting at the gate blind. And many of you may not sit at the gate blind, but you're caught in sin. And you're denying what God wants to do within your life. Allow God to open your eyes and to change you. Allow God to have compassion for you. Allow God to work within your life. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. The song, open my heart, O Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. We need you. We are struggling. And Lord, there are a dying world out there that needs the church to finally stand up and get their eyes off of themselves and get their eyes on the hurting, dying people that need a relationship with Jesus. And Lord, we are that church. So give us the power Give us that boldness. Give us that strength that only you can do. That when we have people that are in our influence, that our sphere of influence, that we have taken our blinders off, we say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I will take my life and I will transport my life into somebody else's. Lord, give us that strength. Give us that power. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Will you please stand to your feet? And if you need your eyes open, if you need a touch of Jesus, if you need your life transformed, they called out and said, this is what I need. And Jesus had compassion. And he changed their life. Do not set sour and so can be satisfied. But Lord, I need you. And let him change you. Today changes everything. Because today your eyes will be open. Let us sing this song and respond to God. Stop him in his tracks and have him come and baptize you with the power that he has given to us through the Holy Spirit of God. It starts today. Your eyes are open. Allow God 
to work within your life.